Sophie. Welcome to Anime Beatdown, where we're covering a legendary piece of shit. It's fine, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> oh, hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sophie. Yeah, so that might require some explaining. Please explain. Okay. If you're of a certain generation, brackets of anime fan, <laughs> because Sin and I are of the same generation, but she's kind of unaware of this dynamic. Mm -hmm. MD Geist, the uh, OVA we're talking about today, is an extremely notorious punching bag. <laughs> so I'm going to start with two quotes here that I think set the, the tone. Uh, the first is from an article called Buried Garbage, by a writer called Justin Savakis, who actually worked for the distributor of MD Geist, and that'll come up later. But he opens his article with, there is no sport left in ripping on MD Geist. Since the time I was a newbie, Geist has been a favorite punching bag of otaku. I have another quote here from an anime critic called Mike Tool, and he's got, it takes a lot of careful thought, planning, and consideration to determine your 10 least favorite anime titles. But for the variety of titles at the bottom, I consistently see one show up in the number two place. MD Geist. From where I'm standing, it's the most perfect and glorious anime ever created. I have seen it at least a dozen of times. I have actually today, just today, I have actually watched it twice. Once I watched the uh, comic book, the motion <laughs> comic, and later in the day I watched the uh, original with my boyfriend. Of course, my boyfriend, being a casual, was not able to follow MD guys, so I had to explain a lot of it to him. Okay, so the reason that MD guys has the reputation that it has essentially comes down to the way it was very, very aggressively marketed and the time that it came out in the West. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, there's like a bunch of different cuts of MD guys. So the version people are mostly talking about when they're shitting on it <laughs> is is the original cut that was made in 1986. Mm -hmm. And then it was subtitled and released in the US in 1992. So to put it in perspective, like the, the big kind of flashpoint for like, hey, they make cartoons for adults in Japan, BTW, that was Akira. Mm -hmm. So Akira was made in 1988, but it doesn't come out in a dubbed form in the US until 1991. MD Geist comes out in 1992. Uh-oh. So there's not really much room in between those two releases for like much other stuff to come out. So people who got interested in the idea of like, oh, there's like hyper violent animation coming out of Japan. Where do I get more of this? When they went looking, they basically had MD guys to push down their throats as like, this is the next big thing. Right. I found it very difficult to get the exact release dates of the other anime that were being pushed by the same distributor. But from what I've seen, um, the other anime they were pushing at this time was actually Dominion Tank Police, which we watched last time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah with the Pen Pen Pals, yeah. <laughs> um, interestingly, another anime they were pushing, uh, I think this was slightly after MD Geist, is uh, an anime called Dog Soldier Shadows of the Past, <laughs> which is easily ten times worse than MD Geist. Like, it's basically what if Rambo was anime. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm looking, I just Googled it, I'm looking at it now. Um, you're not wrong. So going back to that Justin Savakis article I talked about, like I mentioned, he actually worked for the distributor that pushed MD Guy. So he has this inside information on what it was like there. And he says, John O'Donnell, who was the guy in charge of the distributor, absolutely loved MD Geist. It was pushed through a company called Central Park Media, and they had a little subdivision that was called the U.S. Manga Corps. Okay. And if anyone remembers the U.S. Manga Corps logo, it is actually a picture of MD Geist. Oh, so they were really pushing it. They made a 3D CG model of MD Geist and animated him at the start of the tapes. That's amazing. And they actually refer to him in the credits as the company's spokesmaker. <laughs> you don't need to be a spokesperson. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, so this all just comes from, like, John O'Donnell. 
basically, I think he'd be the second biggest MD Geist fan after you. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, and he's just like, this This is amazing, we have to push this. So mm-hmm. consequently, yeah, if you were into anime in the early 90s, mm-hmm. you probably ended up watching MD Geist. Okay, okay. And specifically, you probably ended up watching the original cut of MD Geist from 1986. <laughs> Which would you would you call it a flawed gem? Mm, I would say it it's less complete than the remaster. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the original cut from nineteen eighty six it has a number of really serious animation errors in it. <laughs> there are scenes that are in slightly different orders. It's a lot harder to follow. Um, that's the version most people remember, but. As we've been discussing, there's multiple cuts of MD Geist. And you know, if you watch all of them, you can get a full picture of what MD Geist is about. What is MD Geist about? Thank you so much. So again, the reason that there's multiple cuts of MD Geist and also an MD Geist sequel mm-hmm. is again the result of John O'Donnell, the guy in charge of Central Park Media. But I feel like they didn't do a good enough job because I've been trying to look for MD Geist merchandise and I can't find any. It's a shame. It's a shame. (laughs) So I'm going to quote Justin Savakis again. The idea to do an MD Geist special edition two disc DVD set came directly from John (laughs) O'Donnell and was greeted with groans by the production staff. As John so loved the show... It would be inevitable that we'd be spending months compiling the most ridiculously complicated disc of our careers. (laughs) And I think, like, that's a pretty good overview of how complicated that MD Guy special edition is, because you mentioned, like, you watched a motion comic. Yeah. There is actually an option on the MD Guy's DVD to watch the movie and have the soundtrack played over panels of the comic like it's fucking Watchmen. Get your stinking hands the hell off our stuff! You scum wouldn't even know how to use it. I'm the only one here who really has the skill. It's, yeah, that's, it's amazing. It was so well put together. There are, like, effects, zoom in, zoom out. It's, like, it's it was wonderful. The DVD also comes with a bunch of supplemental material aside mm-hmm. from that. One of my favorite parts, which I only just learned about while researching this, is that John O'Donnell had an empty Geist motorcycle made. (laughs) (laughs) And he took it around anime conventions. Oh my god. And there's photos of him and the director of MD Geist posing with the motorcycle. That's amazing. And he made a very odd advertisement. It basically amounted to, hey, we want to make an MD Geist comic. Do you know how to draw? (laughs) (laughs) He didn't really want to approach any major publishers. He's just like, hey, can anyone out there draw MD Geist? We'll pay you. Hey, Holtzy. (laughs) Essentially. (laughs) And that led to the creation of an MD Geist three-issue prequel series. What? Called MD Geist Ground Zero. You need to send them over. I No, no, no. I did. I did. You did? I sent them to you, but the thing is they're on the DVD as JPEGs. Oh, I see now. I see the message, Sophie. Yes. Oh, no, I missed this important MD Geist message. Let me download them right now. Well, let's not be too <laughs> hasty there, because I will reveal to you that the dimensions of each of these comic pages, once scanned in and digitized are 267 by 420. So I just clicked one. Um, I can't read what it says, but... No, you can't read any of this. I can extrapolate from the pictures. This is not, like, a problem that I have caused through, like, compression. This is what they actually are like on the disc. They give you three issues of a comic that you cannot actually read. This is amazing. (laughs) It looks okay. like the made-up galactic alphabet from Commander <laughs> Keen. It's just a bunch of little dots. <laughs> Maybe I can run it through an AI. Is there an AI that specializes in MD Geist? 
The other thing about this release of MD Geist is that it's the director's cut of MD Geist, where they've actually gone and inserted new material. Yeah. They've cleaned up a bunch of animation errors. There's a number of plot holes that they've sort of papered over by adding very awkward additional scenes. (laughs) Where someone will just show up on screen and go, okay, I have to go now, bye, to explain why they're not (laughs) in the movie anymore. (laughs) One of the things about the director's cut that doesn't really uh, add to it is that they do a lot of digital zooms. It's like if they want to zoom in on a character and they didn't have a close-up in the original cut of it, they just blow the image up. Having set the stage for just how much effort went into this amazing release of MD Geist, mm-hmm. all the supplemental material, the motion comic, the actual comic, the new material, <laughs> the new animation... <laughs> What about MD Geist works for you? I mean, I think overall, MD Geist works for me because it's an honest story. Yeah. Yeah, it's honest, it's straightforward, and it explores human psychology. Okay. So let's let's explain that story to people who maybe haven't seen all four versions of MD Geist. Perhaps they've only seen one. Um, <laughs> Perhaps they've well, only seen two. <coughs> well, Sophie, <laughs> the story takes place several hundred years after the end of the Christian era. The human race has invaded many planets and has established cultural and political beachheads. Unfortunately. There is no peace, Sophie, and war no. rage, especially oh. on a planet called Jera. Yeah. Now, I have a question for you. Certainly. If I understand correctly, mm-hmm. this blurb in the beginning of a DVD is only available on the Japanese version. Well, okay. So there's there's three different little blurbs that go at the start of MD Geist, mm-hmm. and it depends on the version that you're watching. So I think two two of them specify it's the end of the Christian era. Mm-hmm. The special edition one, I think the blurb's entirely in Japanese, but they don't subtitle it. Mm-hmm. So if I understand correctly, the version that's aimed at the English audience, the text is in Japanese, whereas the Japanese audience gets their text in English. <laughs> that's that's very powerful. Yeah, okay, great, awesome. Um, now, additionally... Uh, in the comic, the motion comic, we get information that write up states that, you know, on Earth, there's this, this, I guess, project or these people which have been uh, genetically engineered and cloned to have supernatural fighting abilities. Well, I think you'll find in the 1986 cut, it's referred to as super mundane fighting abilities. Super mundane. Yeah, I think you should read that whole blurb. I don't remember it by heart, but it's a good one. Geist's method of fighting proved to be too ferocious. It was decided that his existence proved too great a danger. As a result, in Jera year 843, he was imprisoned in an orbiting satellite. He was also known as Most Dangerous Geist. (laughs) (laughs) When my boyfriend found out that MDS stands for Most Dangerous Soldier. He lost it a little bit. (laughs) So there's quite an in-depth commentary track available from the director and the writer going into how they made this. And Mm -hmm. the initial plan was he would be called Mad Dog Geist. Mad Dog, okay. okay. That's where MD came from. And then gradually he became Most Dangerous. Most Dangerous Soldier. (laughs) Did, Did they explain why the shift happened? I, they, okay, the thing about the commentary track is it was recorded 16 years after the movie was made, and they openly say, I don't remember. <laughs> okay, so basically, if you watch everything together with your English and Japanese friends, you'll understand that uh, basically MD Geist is a genetically engineered super soldier that's very dangerous. Uh, designed by the military to fight. Yeah, so MD Geist is one of the MDS, which stands for the Most Dangerous Soldiers. It's not ever 100% stated whether they were like recruits who got genetically modified or if they were actually cloned, because it's sort of 
half and half, depending on who's talking. Yeah. Um, but the gist of it is he is a super soldier. He is this, like, one-man army, but then it turns out he's actually too dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they decide that in order to protect themselves, they have to seal MD Geist in an orbiting satellite <laughs> where he will be held in stasis. The satellite, by the way, is a really cool design that looks like a giant hourglass. Yes, that's very yeah. amazing. At the start of the movie, the space prison crashes back to Earth. MD Geist emerges completely naked, a la the Terminator. <laughs> and he then encounters this sort of like Mad Max slash Fist of the North Star style roving gang of anime punks. Mm -hmm. He defeats their leader in single combat, so they elect him as the new leader. Mm -hmm. The sort of uh, brains of that outfit is a lady called Vaya. Vaya believes that he is sort of their ticket to salvation. So this then leads to MD Geist and his gang attacking this enormous military tank. While that's happening, Geist realizes that one of the soldiers on board the tank is actually his old commander from before he was put in stasis. Mm -hmm. The commander also recognizes him. Mm -hmm. The commander then reveals that their mission is that there is a doomsday device just called Death Force mm -hmm. that is going to go off in about 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And they are on their way to deactivate Death Force, so he sort of recruits Geist to go and deactivate Death Force. Yeah. It's not a particularly long story, so at this point we're pretty much over with, and then the end of it is just this extended sequence of Geist and the other soldiers attacking the place where the Death Force is controlled, which is a huge computer called the Brain Palace. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end of that... Um, the colonel betrays Geist, locking him in a room with what looks like uh, if Dark Souls was Mega Man X, sort of like weird robot monster that yeah. ends up... It's a three-phase boss fight, it's a three -phase which is interesting. <laughs> Geist then defeats the robot, realises he's being betrayed, Merc's his old commander. Vaya then reveals that she's survived, so it's just Geist and Vaya, everyone else is dead, there is no more Death Force, it seems like a happy ending... And then Guy suddenly turns back toward the computer and reactivates Death Force. Mm -hmm. And then he grabs Vaya by the throat mm -hmm. and says, the game's only just beginning. And that's the end. Bravo. Do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, that's the superficial story of it. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you want to do a quick TLDR. How would how would you make that more complicated? Because I think I pretty much covered everything. <laughs> well, oh, um, <laughs> well, okay. Um, um, I mean, if we look at the characters individually. <laughs> okay. So, we have MD Geist, right? <laughs> we know that he's very dangerous clone soldier he's the most dangerous he's not very dangerous <laughs> so and uh from beginning to end because like when you say it like that people might be like oh my god why did why did md guys activate death force that's a little weird but it's actually not it's actually very honest very transparent and very consistent it's what his character has been doing the entire time. Ever since he awoke and he's been getting into fights. And he's literally said, I don't care about anything else. I just, well, no, actually, I'm sorry. I'm not being completely accurate. What happened was after Vi recruited him to, his, to her gang, she was like, you know, trying to like seduce him because she's essentially looking for a gang leader, but also for somebody to protect her. And when she started trying to warm up to him and seduce him, he's like, look, I don't care about any of that stuff. I just want you to tell me where I can find the army. That's what I'm looking for. And we, even when they do find, you know, the army, like you mentioned, uh, where the, there's a tank, an army tank being, uh, English word, being attacked, <laughs> Vi is like, oh, they'll pay us if we protect them or whichever side is the weakest will pay us to protect them. And Geist was like, you know, I don't really care about the money. I, I care about a good fight. So the writer and director actually talk about that being a deliberate character choice. And as 
specifically a reaction against other anime protagonists of the time. Mm-hmm. So Ohara, Koichi Ohara, so Koichi Ohara, who is the director, he talks very openly in the commentary track about how he grew up watching Gundam. Mm-hmm. And the thing about Gundam to him was that it had a lot of like conflicted, angsty protagonists in it. Okay. So when he came to like make his own anime, he's like, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. And have a character who actually is not conflicted. Okay, yeah, yeah. He just has, like, a mission to accomplish and he doesn't mm-hmm. care about anything else. He's almost okay. like the Terminator. Yeah. He also talks about how, like, a lot of MD Geist to him is a reaction to Gundam. Mm-hmm. Not just the character of Geist, but, like, he talks about the way that the fights are staged in MD Geist. Um, we noticed this when we were watching it is, like, despite the fact that it's all like mechs and cannons and tanks and things, when Geist is fighting people, he's actually jumping on top of the mechs and like stabbing them through the cockpit. Mm -hmm. So Ohada specifically said that's his response to Gundam because Mm -hmm. in Gundam it was all in space. And he said, I just, I would watch these fights and it was all missiles going from like a mech to another mech and it blowing up. So Mm -hmm. he wanted everything to be very up close and personal and feel very physical. Yeah. Yeah. And he specifically designed Geist's armor to come across like it's just there to provide torque. It's not there to actually be armor. It's just there to boost his natural strength. Yeah, yeah. Even like we talked about this, but the final showdown between um, Geist and uh, Colonel Krutz, it was just Geist coming up to him and just uh, squeezing his head until it exploded. That was it. (laughs) Yeah, they talk on the commentary track about how, like, they actually had way more planned, but they ran out of money. Oh, okay. And they, they did want to have, like, a climactic fight between Geist and Kruitz. Mm-hmm. But, like you said, it just ends with Geist walking in and just crushing Kruitz's head very casually in his hand. I, I like that. I like that because it's, like, there's just been this really elaborate fight sequence with the huge, like, axe robot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's almost like that's like the punctuation mm-hmm. to it. No, I loved it. I loved it. It was perfect. So this was Koichi Ohada's first job as a director. Okay, well, he did excellent. He was only 23 when he made this, but he'd been working in the industry for quite a while at that point. And um, he talks about how like he felt frustrated that he would be tasked with designing things for shows and he would come up with what he thought were really, really cool and interesting and inventive designs and they'd say no. Aww. tone it down a little bit Aww. so when he finally got control over his own ova it's like it's essentially just an excuse for him to like use designs he thought were cool and no one else would approve of oh so like consequently everything in md geist is like really really over designed but it looks great yeah it's amazing i especially love the horsemen at the end um, I think they were added in the English version. Okay, so no, they weren't. This is the thing. Like they I weren't. mentioned, they, they had plans for things that were never right. filmed. So yeah. throughout the the OVA, you will see these like schematics and stills yes, of yes. what it looks like a giant mechanical centaur with a cannon in its crotch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's like the main death force unit that's going to mm-hmm. destroy the planet. Yeah. You see them and they never really do anything. But Ohad has said, like, no, I designed that because I thought it would actually be in it. And then we oh. ran out of money. <laughs> so this is Ohada's first director's credit. He doesn't actually get the full director's credit on the original release. He's credited as co-director with another director called Hayato Ikeda. Basically, because Ohada wasn't considered to be experienced enough, he just basically mm-hmm. got Ikeda to sign off on, like, actually, I'm co-directing. Okay. Ikeda's actually in the movie. Who is he? When they show the president has been assassinated. At the Sandoria Gardens? <laughs> at Sandoria Gardens. It's the amazing world building of MD Geist. Um, the president is Hayato Ikeda. They use a picture of him. <laughs> that's amazing. So that's his little cameo. Oh, that's so cute. Everything in it, like even with the animation errors and like the weird pacing and everything... The designs are all extremely strong. Yeah. 
And like Ohara talks about how like he would design these things and then the animators would refuse to animate them because they were too complicated. <laughs> so quite a bit of MD Geist is like actually just animated by Ohara himself. Wow. He says it was partially that like the other animators said, we won't do this unless you simplify the design. Mm-hmm. But it was also that he felt such an attachment mm-hmm. to the things he designed that he didn't want someone else animating them. Okay, okay. Yeah, so a lot of this is just actually just Ohada making sure everything... It's like an auteur piece. Yeah. <laughs> He's absolutely making sure everything looks exactly the way he wants. Oh, man. The tank that they end up attacking, like, that has a very distinct shape with these weird prongs sticking out the front. Mm-hmm. And it has this this massive antenna aerial on the back that looks like the mast of a ship. The gang that Geist meets at the start, they drive around in this um, extremely weird looking contraption that is like, it's like the lower half of a tank, but then the top half is like this huge rib cage. And then there's this massive like cow skull mounted on the front. And it kind of looks like it has like a Masters of the Universe vibe to it. Like those weird vehicles from He-Man. There's all these weird little details, like when Vaya is seducing Geist, they're in a tent, but like the tent is sort of weirdly sort of opulent and gothic. And like there's, there are these candles that's like lighting the room, giving it mood lighting. But again, that's like this weird skull candelabra that looks like it's from Castlevania. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we mentioned like at the end of it, there's just this extended sequence of them fighting a whole lot of robots. Yeah. And every single one of the robots has a different design. They do. They do. Did they talk a lot about the lore on your special DVDs? No. No, they don't remember it. Okay, well... It's been 16 years. <laughs> because you're like, you know when you mentioned the uh, in the beginning, one of the DVDs talks about the end of a Christian era. Yeah, yeah. And the actual <laughs> army, a.k.a. regular army, a.k.a. Noah guards. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Um, when when Crude betrays Geist, he's like, uh, God wants all evil to be defeated or something. So I feel like there was something happening there. Well, the name Crude is actually from the word crucify. Like, they specify that. that. That's good, but also you just made me think of something. In the anime, they say Crude, like yeah. C-R-U-T-S. Yeah. But in the comic book, it's Kurtz, K U R T. Z or something. Yeah. Yeah, so like there's a sort of half um <laughs> half actually no, no, it's not half. So there's actually a convention to the names in MD Geist, which is like I think lost on most people because you don't actually realize a lot of the characters' names because they won't say them on screen. <laughs> there kind of is a naming convention in MD Geist, but for three out of the four characters the justification from the writer is he just liked that word. (laughs) He'd been watching a lot of horror movies to get himself sort of psyched to write it. So MD Geist is named after Poltergeist. Mm -hmm. Vaya, if you look at the art book, they call it Pyre, and that is supposed to be Vampire. Mm -hmm. The, The boss of the gang that Geist kills... They don't ever say it on screen, but his name is Golem. Mm -hmm. And then confusingly, um, one of the other members of that gang is called Gist, but not Geist. (laughs) So the Kroots character, when they started mentioning we're naming them after movies we were watching, I'm like, oh, Kroots is Kurtz. He's Kurtz from Apocalypse Now, because Colonel Kroots, Colonel Kurtz. Mm. But then they say, no, Kroots is supposed to come from Cross mm-hmm. because they viewed Kroots as like, he's the good guy technically. He's like the holy one who's doing the good thing. And Geist is actually evil, even though he's nominally the protagonist. Right. So that's where Kroots comes from. And they also say that like, again, reacting to Gundam, they specifically wrote Kroots as if he were, like, a protagonist in Gundam, Mm -hmm. where he's this, like, kind of slightly conflicted military leader who has a job to do and is worried about the people under him dying during it. Okay. 
And he is worried because he was very upset when when yeah. Hans and Sakamoto um, perished. Hold on, you'll make it. It doesn't look that bad. Colonel, you and Mr. Geist have to get to the control room quickly. <laughs> They're all dead, again! So he's very upset when Hans and Sakamoto die, who are the only two guys under him who have lines. But then he helpfully reminds us that- Hans, Lester, Jack, Sakamoto, John, Lewis. At least your sacrifices were not in vain. Um, in the comic we had Hans, Lester, Jack, Sakamoto, but in the dub we have an additional John and Lewis. <laughs> And um, as we know, Sakamoto's primary character trait is he agrees with Hans. With all due respect, sir, I agree with Hans. He agrees with Hans. <laughs> That's literally his only line. <laughs> um, interesting little little uh, change across the dubbing. In the 1986 one, it's Hans who agrees with Sakamoto. What? I know. They've completely oh 180 that relationship. <laughs> When Empty Guys first came out and people developed a loathing of it, it was in subtitled form. <laughs> but then when they released the definitive director's cut, they got it dubbed. Do you want to talk about the dub? <laughs> I, I don't know what to say about it. It's like, as someone who didn't watch a lot of 80s dubbed anime. Yeah. I've never really experienced anything of this magnitude before. I feel like Geist and Vaya's voice actors think they're <laughs> in completely different movies. <laughs> so the thing about Geist's voice actor is he is completely monotonous throughout. The Nexum army wouldn't be chasing the tank unless it was significantly undermanned. The weaker side is desperate and scared. This can be read in one of two ways. Mm-hmm. We can either view this as, like, Geist is the perfect killing machine, so he doesn't really have emotions, and he's just saying what he thinks. Or perhaps he just wasn't a very good actor. <laughs> Vaya's voice actor is the polar opposite of this. Ha! We control this territory as far as you can see. I've been waiting a long time for someone just like you. She went all out. <laughs> I think what she might be doing is she's trying to match the motions on screen. So she's mm -hmm. emphasizing whatever syllable is being said when Vaya moves her hands, even if that doesn't make any sense. Listen, Geist, enough of this social crap. Let's skip the chit chat and get to the point. <laughs> and this culminates in one of the greatest speeches in the history of cinema. <laughs> a speech that even though like I hadn't seen this for five years when I mm -hmm. went back to watch it I remembered every single word of that shut up you stupid hyena we fight our own damn battles we don't need scum like you <laughs> I'm a hyena yeah I live off dead men but who made me that way you the army boys your damn battles have killed almost everyone on the planet most of the people that dreamed of a bright future got snuffed out like candles. And the unlucky few who aren't dead yet are now left in a living hell. If I'm a hyena, then you're a demon from hell. If I'm a hyena, then you're a demon from hell. So an interesting side effect of Geist's voice actor delivering the lines the way he does is that there is a moment in this that just confused the hell out of both of us mm -hmm. um it confused me for literally like 20 years i had no <laughs> idea what was supposed to be going on and it yeah. is it is a sequence where geist talks to Kroots and geist <laughs> just goes Kroots, over fogein stein Kroots, over <laughs> And then there's a dramatic pause, as if that's supposed to be significant. But what was he saying? <laughs> I had 
really no idea what this was supposed to be, did not know what to make of it. But thankfully, due to the magic of DVD, we can use subtitles. What he's saying is, Crude's oviled full grain strime, which itself raises more questions. Like, is, is this a magic spell? That's actually his name. His full name is Colonel Crude's oviled full grain strime. Strime. And that is supposed to be the big reveal that Geist remembers him. I also think it's quite clear beforehand that Geist knows who he is. What one of one of the more confusing moments in the MD Geist canon. Who's your favorite character in MD Geist 1? Other than Hans and Sakamoto. <laughs> <laughs> and of course Lester. <laughs> um I think I think I like Vaya the most. I think um, she's the tragic hero in all of this because she's figured out what she needs to do and she mm-hmm. thinks she's on top of it and mm-hmm. she thinks it's all worked out for her and then at the last minute it's like, no, you you actually misjudged this man. Mm-hmm. You should have figured out there was something off with him uh, before. <laughs> something's off with this man. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But of course, um, not to spoil anything, but Vaya does come back in MD Geist 2. Oh man, I love her arc. It's like, yeah, yeah. it's so good. But you know what's interesting? In MD Geist 1, she's with Geist, right? Yeah. And he's no good for her. Like, she deserves no. better, but she doesn't want to leave him because she's scared. And it is a scary world, and she's looking for a protector. In the second one, it's kind of an opposite situation where the man he's with, she can't leave him because he's unhinged. I also appreciate that Geist is consistent throughout um, both both episodes. He's the most dangerous. He, he's the most dangerous, yeah. He achieves his dream in the first one and he goes for his He achieves next, his dream you know. of global genocide in the first one. I think that brings us to the end of this uh, discussion of MD Geist. According to Sophie, I could talk about this for like five more hours, but... Well, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do the sequel, we'll do the sequel. No, I could still, still talk about the first one. Yeah, well, we can do that when we do the sequel. <laughs> okay. Actually, Sin, now would be a good time to mention that if you do actually want to listen to Sin talk about MD Geist even more, the two of us recorded a commentary track to MD Geist uh, approximately 24 hours ago. Yeah, and if you are a patient, you can access that. Patreon.com slash Sinclair Lord. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was that was MD Geist. I think the thesis of this episode has basically been like, yeah, if you just saw Akira and then you were hoping for something that was on the same level as Akira and you got the 1986 cut of this, I understand your frustration. Mm-hmm. I also understand your frustration that for some reason, the guy in charge of the distribution company was completely obsessed with MD Geist and kept putting him in everything, even though you didn't like him. But um, that was uh, 38 years ago. And in the interim, you know, we're not going to run out of anime. Arguably, there's too much of it. And I can off the top of my head think of so many things that are so much worse than MD Geist. I looked at some of the shit Central Park Media released, it's much worse than this. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sen. Thank you, Sakamoto, Hans, <laughs> Lester, John, <laughs> the others. <laughs> They're all dead again. Another great thing that they added to the MD Geist DVD is a music video of uh, one of the great MD Geist songs that plays during it. And um, they actually do it by editing footage of MD Geist to make it look like he is dancing. Can you send that to me? I absolutely will. Okay, I send it to you on Discord. Oh my god. I will cherish this forever, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs>